Lord. And so we study, God, how great your house is, the called out people of God, and how much greater it is than the house which Moses built, Father. And God, your house is made without hands, God, and may we recognize your spiritual house this morning as we study your word, and uh, may we all gather together in, in one name under Jesus Christ. Lord, and we pray all these things in his holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. So, this past week, these past couple of weeks, we've done Hebrews chapter 1 and Hebrews chapter 2. Now we've moved on to Hebrews chapter 3. In Hebrews 1 and 2, we've talked about, you know, how Christ is much higher than the angels, but yet he was made lower than them when he became man, but yet his divinity was still there as, as God. Because God, Jesus dwelled in eternity past, present, and he still dwells as God in the future in our time's standpoint. But now, as we move from Hebrews 3, as we talk, as Hebrews 2, we talked about the high priest of Jesus. We move here to Hebrews 3, as we talk about the house of God and the house which He has built, which is far greater than the house of Moses. But we have a greater punishment is given uh, to those who treat with indifference one greater than Moses. So when you, you may have treated Moses in the Old Testament with indifference and rebellion, but now that you're in the New Testament and you treat indifference to the Jesus Christ and you have a greater punishment and a greater just reward for that. And that's what Paul's going to tell us here in Hebrews chapter 3. And like I said in Hebrews 1 and 2, Paul gives us the argument that Christ is much superior than the angels. But now as we read this chapter, we're going to see that Paul's reasoning unto us that Christ is much superior and much greater than Moses. So in Hebrews 3.1, I'm using multiple translations today. Uh, I just like this verse in Hebrews 3.1 from the Amplified Bible. It says, So then, brethren, consecrated and set apart for God, who share in the heavenly calling, thoughtfully and attentively consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest, whom we confess as ours when we embrace the Christian faith. Another version says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly call- calling, attentively consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest, whom we have confessed. So we have to we have to contemplate, Paul said. Here we have to contemplate and fix your mind on Jesus. Because you have been called from a heavenly calling into the ecclesy of Christ. You know, if the book of Ephesians talks about setting your mind in heavenly places. And that's a great book if you ever want to study about heaven, is that book of Ephesians when Paul tells us our mind has to dwell in heavenly places. But he says that we've been called into a heavenly calling, and that's the greatest call you can ever receive in life, because Paul said in Philippians 3.14, he says, I press toward that goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So we have to press on to the heavenly call that's in Christ Jesus. Jesus is also, he says, he is our apostle and our high priest of our confession. So as apostle, he is sent from the Father to pleading the cause of God with us. Jesus said in John 20, verse 21, So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also sent you. So God the Father sent Jesus, and then he sent his apostles uh, for the message to spread the word. So Jesus is our apostle. He's, he's sent from the Father to plead for us on our behalf. But as our high priest, Jesus pleads our cause with God. He is our, our mediator. He intercedes for us when we pray to Him. God is interceding for us between the Father. So both offices as apostle and high priest are realized in the title mediator. He mediates between God and man. And he is the father of apostles, and the twelve apostles are his apostles. So Christ shares the same title as angel. He's a messenger. Angel of the old, oftentimes in the Old Testament, he was referred to as the angel of the Lord. He also can be referred to as the apostle, the one sent by God. 
But though he shares in the same ministry, he is uniquely above and beyond all God has ever created. So our confession is what God proclaims we confess. So whatever God proclaims that from his word we confess. Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood did not reveal this, but your Father who is in heaven. Hebrews 3.2 says, Who was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all his house. So some of these Jewish Christians uh, still held Moses in very high esteem. They still followed that law that Moses had, the, the law, the, the Ten Commandments, that he'd rather, they'd rather follow that. And Paul begins here in this verse uh, his comparisons of Moses to Christ. Because Moses was faithful in God's house, but yet God's house is much greater than the house in which Moses had created. Numbers 12.7 says, Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. So yes, Moses was faithful to, his, to the, God's house. But we're going to get the distinction between the difference of the houses. The one that Moses built in the Old Testament and the one that Christ has built uh, since prophesying the days of Moses and then on the day of Pentecost when God was building His house. So Jesus is mediating as our high priest and He is faithful till death and He's still going to be faithful after death as God has appointed Him. Acts 2.36, the one that pricks you in the heart when you read it and what I guarantee you pricked him on the day of Pentecost said, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Christ. You know, I was talking to a guy at Walmart. He actually happens to be the guy I've been talking to for months now at Food Line. And we have discussed baptism. And it was funny he brought up this verse. We weren't even discussing baptism in Acts 2.36. I said, why didn't you keep going? You read Acts 2.36. Let all the house of Israel know for certain that just Jesus you crucified has been made both Lord and Christ. But yet, what was the response to that call? They were pricked to the heart and they asked, Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what must we do to be saved? And Peter said, Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That was the call to the reason why, to the repentance to crucify the Son of God. So you've got to keep going. You just can't stop at Acts 2.36. You've got to read 237, 38, 39, 40, 41, and 42 as the continuation of the church. But God has made him high priest. Hebrews 3.3, 3, For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory. And as much as he who built the house has more honor than the house. So Jesus is the one who has built the house. And he has more honor than the house which he has built. He is worthy of more glory. The Lord said, in, or Moses had prophesied of the Lord in Deuteronomy 18.15, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren, him you shall hear. So we knew through the Messianic line that they were going to raise up for Christ, a Christ child who is going to be like a prophet, but yet he's still going to be God. So Christ is the builder, and he has more honor than the house. And they can't, the house cannot be a literal building, for it has lasted these 2,000 years, and it will endure forever. And Jesus fitted it with living stones. You know, the Bible says he built a house made without hands. Whenever you see made without hands in the Bible, it means man didn't make it. It meant that God was the builder. So Jesus is much greater than his servants, such as Moses such as the Old Testament prophets, such as David. Christ is still greater than all those men. And yet Moses still did not enter the house when he was alive. 
Moses didn't get to enter the promised land. And we know that in Hebrews 11, it talks about Abraham was looking for a city and walls, you know, that he, the walls at which you could not measure. He was looking out for a city because that city was not on earth. He was looking for heavenly things. He was looking for the city which was heaven. But Abraham not, didn't get to find heaven until after Calvary when Jesus went into the Hadean world and he led captivity captives and he gave gifts to men. That's when all those Old Testament prophets and saints got to inherit the kingdom of God. So there's something about faithfulness that causes us as brothers and sisters, in spite of all of our weaknesses, all of our trials and tribulations, but we cannot help but love and appreciate when brothers and sisters gather together under the name of the Lord and worship as the ecclesia of Jesus. Hebrews 3, 4 says, For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. Ephesians 2, 10 has said, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. You know, God's working and working in every one of our lives. You know, he's building us, us up, he's edifying us to be equipped. And it says here, in continuation in 2.10, it says, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So all these things God has laid out before us, He's chosen a path for us, but yet there's always going to be a variation of the path that we choose. Because we're either going to do the will of God or we're not. But yet God has prepared us a path for good works, that we should walk in those good works, that we should bear the fruit of the, of the, the fruits of the Spirit. Now we will walk in them. Hebrews 3 5 says, And Moses indeed was faithful in all of his house as a servant, for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. So Moses was a faithful servant as to what should be in the, said in the future. So Moses was a, type, was a type of Christ in the Old Testament, because Moses led the people of sin out of the land of Egypt and was trying to lead them to the promised land. They crossed the Red Sea, which John has been teaching all was the type of baptism, crossing through the Red Sea, leaving the land of sin, crossing the Red Sea, baptism, and then you got the 40 years in the wilderness representing your walk with God, your Christian walk. But Christ as a son, Hebrews 3, 6, over his own house, whose house we are, if, we hold fast. You know, that word if is so important because it tells you that yes, you can fall away from the living God. You can receive the Holy Spirit when you are baptized in the Christ and you can taste of the heavenly calling and yet you can come back into the world and you can fall away. You could be held captive again to, to the traditions and philosophies of men and you can fall away from the living God. That's why he, Paul says, if you hold fast, the confidence and the rejoicing of hope firm until the end. See, Christ enters the Father's house as a son and a master over it. And Moses wasn't the son of God. Moses was a servant and he was in view of the house. He wasn't in the house. So whose house we are. So we are part of the house of God. Christians make up the house of God. It's called the ecclesia. It's the called out people of God. Like I said earlier, that we have a heavenly calling. We are called to be sons of God. We are called to live according to His will. Which again argues that Christ did not build a physical building. And you see all these physical buildings, these temples, quote unquote, these cathedrals. God didn't build those. God wasn't in that. Man was in that. And if you ever look at the architecture, you can see all the paganism. Uh, I wish I had my pictures. I could, on some of those dromos they had over there in Italy, of all the, the, the papacy they put on there, all the paganism they put on, on those cathedrals, it's just ungodly. And the worshiping of angels all over their cathedrals. But God wasn't in that. God didn't build a physical building, but He built a spiritual one, the one that you and I are a part of this morning and for all eternity. 2 Corinthians 5.1 says, For we know...
that if our earthly house, this tent, our body, is destroyed, we have a building from God. A house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So yes, our body, our body is decaying every day and will be destroyed. But we have a building from God. A house made without hands. And Paul has said, whose house we are, if, if we hold fast. Holding fast is just so important because Jesus said to him, who overcomes, I will grant him a crown of life in Revelation 2.10. Jesus is even saying, if you overcome, I'll grant you a crown of life. Jesus also said in Matthew 10.22, And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. So if you endure, you're going to be saved. You're going to enter the kingdom of God. You're going to enter heaven. The gates of the, the pearly gates. And now here in Hebrews 3, 7 is where it really starts to stir up your spirit, you stir up your mind. It says, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you will hear His voice. So Paul is saying, take heed. Lest what happened there in the Old Testament congregation of Israel would happen to you. And he quotes Psalms 95, verse 7 and 11, which is, I think is kind of, Ironic that Paul quotes Psalms 97, 7 through 11, and the verses that, and well, the way it's written here in the Bible, it's verse 7 through 11 in Hebrews chapter 3. But Paul's saying, take heed. He says, here in Psalm 95, 7 through 11, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me. So, Paul's saying to these Hebrew Christians, and I even refer to it speaking to us, don't harden your hearts as they did in Old Testament Israel, when they tested me. You know, do we test God today? Do we throw things in the face of God to see what God would do? You know, it would break God's heart. And when Paul says, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says in Hebrews 3, 7, Paul is saying that this message is directly speaking to you from the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit is specifically telling you and instructing you, do not harden your hearts, but take heed. The Holy Spirit is the author of all Scripture, but if we were given a topic of choice to address today, what do you think the Holy Spirit would warn us to preach and what the Holy Spirit would warn us about? And I came across this in 1 Timothy 4, verse 1 and 2. I think this is what the Holy Spirit would speak to us today. 1 Timothy 4, verse 1 and 2. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. So the Spirit is expressly prophesying here that in in the last days, in latter times, people are going to depart from the faith. You know, Paul prophesied to the Ephesian elders. He said, look, there's going to be wolves that are going to come in that are going to be in sheep's clothing. And they're going to devour the flock. And if it happened then, it's going to happen 2,000 years later when you got people coming in the congregation who pretend to be sheep but are just ravenous wolves and they're going to destroy the flock. Men are going to depart from the faith. They're going to give heed to deceiving spirits and the doctrines of demons. You know, you can't take partake of the doctrine of Jesus Christ and the doctrine of demons. James said a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You can't partake of the cup of demons and the cup of Jesus Christ. There's only one cup, and that's the, the cup of the blood of the new t- covenant. Do this in remembrance of Him. So 
So today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. The fathers in the Old Testament tested Him. They tried Him. And they saw my work. For forty years I was grieved with that generation. And said, It is a people who go astray in their hearts. And they do not know my ways. So I swore my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. So they went astray in their hearts. As later we study, we're going to study about the heart. Why you should never go after your feelings, your emotions, and your heart. But in Hebrews 3.9 it says, Where your fathers test me, tried me, and saw my works for 40 years. They saw God's miracles for 40 years. And they still didn't believe. For three years they had Jesus Christ. Three and a half years they had Jesus performing miracles, signs, and wonders. Healing the lame. Resurrecting Lazarus from the dead. He himself resurrected from the dead. And yet they still don't believe. Not only did he resurrect from the dead, but he ascended on high to the throne of God. And they still don't believe. Two thousand years later, you still don't believe. That's why you have so many schisms today. You have all this atheism. You have all this Gnosticism. You have all the homosexuals wanting to be mad at God because they think God made them that way. But they don't believe in the sanctity of life. God said, I swore my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Speaking of a spiritual rest. They tempted proving God to see if He really existed. People today want to prove and see if God really existed. Like Mussolini had wanted to tempt and prove God if He existed. But God's not going to come and strike Him with a lightning bolt because He's not worth God's time. For 40 years, God performed those miracles and they still didn't believe. But today in which Paul is writing, today if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. He writes to the Hebrews, will be from the time of this, that writing that he wrote to the overthrow of Jerusalem, the country and the religion itself in 70 A.D. So that today, you better hearken. You don't have much time. You better repent. It was too late. Hebrews 3.10 says, Therefore I was angry with that generation and said, They always go astray in their heart and they do not know my ways. So God is grieved. Now God in heaven today is greatly grieved. He's greatly displeased. And you can't continue to kill babies and expect God to bless us. Not just in this country, but all around the world. He's, God had said in Leviticus twenty six twenty eight. He says, Then I also will walk contrary to you in fury, and I, even I, will chasten you seven times for your sins. You know, that's how you know if you're a child of God, if you know you sin and you you repent. You know God's going to chasten you because He loves you. No father's going to chasten his child unless he loves him. And I praise God for the chastening He does give me sometimes. Because with that chastening, I'm, re- I'm corrected and I repent. And I fall on my face and praise God. Because God said He swore in His wrath, they will not enter. They're not going to enter the promised land. They've tested me. I've proved them. they test me again. They're not going to enter. I'm done with them. God knew what obstinate children they would be before God even gave the law of Christ. You know, they rejected the, the law of Moses. And when God prof- prophesied in Isaiah 2, Psalms 2, about speaking of the law going forth from Mount Zion, speaking of the day of Pentecost from Jerusalem, the law of Christ, the law of grace was going to be preached. They still, even to that day, rejected it. So they knew God was displeased with them, but they did not one thing. They didn't want to do one thing to please Him. Even though He was displeased, they still didn't want to displease Him. That's why I'm thankful for some of the Old Testament uh, men, the kings like Hezekiah, Josiah, men like David. I'm just thankful that those men 
did want to follow in the ways of the Lord. They did want to repent. But yet God is still greatly displeased. Hebrews 3.11 Then finally, they finally entered Canaan, but not his rest. They may have entered that promised land, but they never enter God's rest. And I think that's a picture that only Jesus can give you true rest for your soul. That you can look and look and find all these idols and things in this world to give you that peace of mind, but it's not going to fulfill anything. Only Jesus can give you that true pleasure and rest and peace. Because you're born... You live life and then you die and then where's your rest going to be? You have to have that rest. You have to have that peace. You know, Jesus said, I give, you, I give you words of life and I give you death. Please choose life. we got to choose life. Either life or death. You know, sometimes you live in life or death situations and Jesus says, choose life. Jesus said, said in Matthew eleven twenty eight verse and twenty nine. Eleven Matthew eleven twenty eight and twenty nine. Come to me. Jesus says, Come to me. All who all you who labor and are heavy laden, all you who have all these burdens, you feel like you're just nothing in this world, you feel like the world's just beating you up, come to me, Jesus says, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus says, take your yoke, for my yoke is light. The stuff the world gives you is so heavy, burdensome, it's going to bring you down. But in me, you're going to find rest for your souls. Beware, brethren, Hebrews 3.12, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. So the heart, he's saying, is it cannot be trusted. They always go astray in their hearts. God says they always go astray in their hearts. You know, schisms and divisions can enter a congregation uh, by feelings and emotions and I want to do this, I want to do that, but with, without, con, without consolidating the Word of God and the will of God. And they choose feelings and emotions rather than godly wisdom and that can cause strife in a congregation. It can cause strife in a home. So peace and harmony, harmony prevail when people are not led by their heart and emotions. Their heart is deceitful above all things. And Jeremiah 17.9 says, Who can know it? You know, the heart is deceitful by all, by all things, but who can know it? And there's only one man who can know it, and that's Jesus Christ. The apostles at the time, they had the power, you know, of the story of in the Acts chapter 5-6 of Ananias and Sapphira. They uh, blasphemed in the Holy Spirit and Peter says, why did you lie? And they were struck dead like that. They knew the heart. You know, they sold their land and they didn't give all the proceeds uh, to the ecclesia and they lied and said they gave it all but they kept a portion of it. And they were struck dead at the spot. Only God knows the hearts of men. So don't be living by your heart and your emotions and feelings because you know, you see all the denomination in the world wanting to live by their their emotions and feelings, and that's how they believe they are saved, by their emotions and their feelings. But God didn't say you must repent, feel sorry, cry, and you shall be saved. Jesus didn't say that. He said, Peter had said, repent and be baptized. Repentance is true sorrowfulness. It's not worldly sorrow. Sorrowfulness is, look, I crucified the Son of God. I'm the one who put them on that cross. And they knew they put them on that cross. And that's why they repented. That's why you, me, and everybody in this room repented. Because we knew we crucified the Son of God. You 
He said, Beware, lest any of you of an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. Can you imagine departing from the living God? Jesus didn't call us to depart. He said, Come unto me. Jesus said, Come unto me and I will give you rest. That's it. Departing would be the opposite. And I think that's the greatest woes is for God to depart from us. Jesus is the living God and He's not that lifeless idol that we so desperately please and worship. Hebrews 3.13 But exhort one another daily while it is called today lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Today, I I believe, is the day of grace he's talking about. And today, God, you're under a covenant of grace. He said in Luke 4.21, Jesus said, And he began to say to them, Today the Scriptures is is fulfilled in your hearing. So the Scriptures which Jesus preached were fulfilled when they listened and heard it. And also, I think that the day that he's talking about today is uh, before the Lord comes back in judgment on Jerusalem. Not the Lord comes back. The Lord comes in judgment which, on Jerusalem. The day of visitation that we've read in Luke 19. The day of visitation here. It says, He's going to level you and your children within you, within you to the ground and they will not leave and you one stone upon, upon another because you do not know the time of your visitation. The Jews didn't recognize the time of their visitation. You know, look, Jesus told us you to repent. You don't repent. Well, your, visit, your time of visitation is coming. You said, let the blood be on us and upon our children's hands. That's 20, one generation is about 20 years, another generation another 20 years, 40 years. 33 A.D. to 70 A.D., you had 27 years to repent. 27 to 30 years to repent. You didn't repent. The time of visitation is at hand. He said, Lest you, none of you, be deceived by sin. So do not be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. So we are partakers of Christ. And you're partakers of the Holy Spirit. You have to hold fast until the end. That's twice now he says hold fast. We have to hold fast. We either read later in Hebrews that, you know, there's an anchor from heaven, salvation for the soul. You have to hold fast. I like to picture you're grabbing hold of that anchor on, on the heaven and you're not letting go. And you have to hold fast to what we have started. You know, I would hate to be ashamed that when we start a good work for the kingdom of God and maybe right before maybe Christ comes back or before our death and we just let everything, the work we started and we fall away from the church of the living God. So we have to hold fast to what we started. Because Ezekiel tells us we have to hold fast to what we have started. In Ezekiel chapter 18, turn with me there. Ezekiel 18, verse 24 and 26. This is very important. That you might think you're a Christian and that once you're saved, you're always saved. That's just not the case. If God calls you to be a son of God, you're a son of God for all eternity. But when a righteous man, Ezekiel 18, 24 turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and does according to all the abominations that the wicked man does, shall he live? All the righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered because of the unfaithfulness of which he is guilty and the sin which he has committed. Because of them he shall die. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not fair. Hear now, O house of Israel, is it not my way which is fair, and your ways which are not fair? When a righteous man turns away from his righteousness, commits iniquity, and dies in it, it is because of the iniquity which he has done that he dies. 
So what he's saying is, yes, you could have been a righteous, but if you turn to wickedness, you're going to die because of your sin. You can live a righteous life, and at that last moment in time, you commit iniquity, and you don't repent, you're going to die for it. And then they call out, oh, this isn't fair. We live, God, we live righteous our whole life, and we commit one sin, and we're going, going to hell? He says, it is fair. God's saying it is fair. It's my ways are fair as your ways which are not. So we have to hold fast. We, can, we have to stay fast as a righteous man or woman in Christ Jesus. You know, and I do cringe to think, what if that happened to me? What if I could live a righteous life and then I fall away? You know, Paul said it's impossible to, for them to renew again to repentance if you tasted a heavenly gift and you have fallen away. And these Jewish Christians, and even Christians today, are told from the beginning uh, to be solid, to build your foundation on the rock. You have to hold fast. And then you should, you should reflect and see what has happened lately. Am I living according to the Word of God? And, is it good to re- and it's good to remember where you started in the, in the beginning. Like in... In Revelation, Jesus said, remember your first love. Repent from where you have fallen. Remember your first love. And Jesus is that first love. When we came out of the water, we gave a baptism. That was Jesus was our first love. And we've got to recognize that. Hebrews 3.15, While it is said today, if you will hear His voice and not harden your hearts as the rebellion. So make the most of every day. Rather than a warning, let it be made known in enjoyment. Rather than living in fear and worry, enjoy the times that God has given you. You can make your day what you want it to be. Either you can be filled with joy and let your day be filled with the Lord, or you can let your joy be filled with the, the, what you watch on the TV, the news, the, the, the deceitfulness of the philosophies of this world. They'll, ho- they'll hold your mind captive. You can also exhort and encourage, or you can just waste away your example that God has given you to be a child of God. For who having heard rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? So even they got out of the land of sin, but yet they still rebel against God. They would still rather be in a land of sin, a land of slavery. And people today would rather be in in slavery and sin than they would be free and have liberty that comes with Christ. And that's why God was, and with the majority of them, God was displeased. So with Joshua and Caleb, they got to enter the promised land. Now with whom was he angry for forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. They could not enter the promised land, even though they, they wanted, they desired it, because they didn't believe. Not only did they not believe the word, but they did not obey it. So belief and obedience are just so important in the kingdom of God. If you hear the word of God, you have to obey it. You just can't have belief and then expect to enter salvation. God says they could not enter because of unbelief. But then He says, And to whom did He swear that they would not enter His rest, but to those who do not obey? The law is given. Obedience must come to the law. The day of Pentecost, the law is given. The law of grace, the law of Christ. Obedience was met on that day. 3,000 souls were added. In continuation and action, Chapter 4, 2,000 more souls are added. All through Acts, more souls are added. Why? Because they obeyed. So you can't have repentance without obedience. A saving faith is an obedient faith. And that's what Paul is saying here as he concluded that you must obey. You know, you Hebrew Christians, you have to obey the words of the Lord. And he's talking and instructing us too as we read this book. 
here in Hebrews. Next week we have Hebrews chapter 4. Again, we talk more here. I've got a Bible here that doesn't have numbers, so that's why I have a highlighter. But uh, we're going to talk again more of the high priest here of Jesus. We might actually, because Hebrews 4 isn't very long, we might do Hebrews 5. It depends on how much stuff we have to cover. But Father in heaven, we love you, and I pray, God, we would repent. I pray that we would not live with rebellion in our hearts, as Korah did. And God, we saw what happened as a result. He was swallowed up in the earth. God, I just pray for forgiveness, God, of all men. I pray, God, that the Holy Spirit and your Son, Jesus Christ, would intercede for us and bargain and plead with us on our behalf, God. I pray that we can be instructed to live according to your ways by your word. And and Lord, your your yoke is so light, God, and this world is just so full of sin. And I pray that we would come to you when we are weary. We would come to you and find rest and peace for our souls. God, we pray we uplift your name today. Your Holy Son, your Holy Precious Son, His blood was spilled on our behalf, Jesus Christ, our prophet, priest, our king, our apostle, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. So many titles, God, that we could spend hours talking about, Father, and we just love you and we praise you. We praise in Jesus' name. Amen.